last week we covered a few headings. We were introducing the topic of enjoy your salah. And we spoke about why it was important that we chose this particular topic in the build-up and the coming to the month of Ramadan. We spoke about how the topic of khushur or the lack thereof was an international complaint. The struggle with khushur in salah is something that spans borders, is cross-continent, it's cross-cultural. Everyone at some point in his or her life has struggled with the battle with khushur. We mentioned the complaint of a Sahabi by the name of Uthman ibn Abi al-As who complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of shaitan who was essentially standing between him and his khushua and his recitation of Qur'an. We mentioned then the statement of Hudayf ibn Yaman if you remember who said that there will come a time when you will enter a masjid and not a single person will be praying in khushua. And then we gave a definition of the word khushu' from an Arabic day-to-day -day usage perspective. An inkhifadu wa dhullu wa sukun, if you remember. And then we gave a definition, an Islamic definition, a working definition of the word khushu' that we wanted you to remember. Who was the imam who gave us the definition? Do you remember his name? Yeah, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, good. And then we went on to ask the question, what is in it for you? So should we succeed in attaining khushu' and we pray with khushu' what is in it for you? What can you expect as a reward? And then we asked the other question, which is what are the consequences of allowing your, your life to pass by without praying in a state of khushu'? And then we went on to speak about examples of people from our past who prayed in the state of khushu'a just to humanize the discussion. And this was really where we left it off. I think we concluded as well by speaking about the layers of khushu'a, if you remember. And we said that a lot of people assume that the topic of khushu'a is just about keeping your mind focused on salah. So that when you are praying, your mind doesn't drift left and right. And for them, this is the be-all and end-all of khushua, such that if you attain it, you are a khashia. And we said, that's not true. That's just entry-level khushua. It's a noble battle, don't get me wrong. That struggle that you and I have when we are in salah to keep your mind fixed on the prayer, but this is not the epitome of khushua. This is the beginning of khushua, your first layer. Then what was the second layer we added on top of that? A stage higher. What was it? The, the, the understanding of the dimensions of salah. Understanding the introductory dua. Understanding al-fatiha. Understanding the dua, the dhikr, the bowing, the prostration. That brings your khushu'a to yet a higher level. In this week, we are going to introduce yet a third and a fourth layer needed before you come into salah. These are mindsets. These are frames of mind that we want you to be in the moment you say Allahu Akbar. And then next week, if Allah gives us life until then, we're going to mention a fifth and a sixth layer. Then in a the week after that, we will enter the salah. And even then, we're not going to begin the salah. We will speak about adhan, we will speak about wudu. Then we will begin with Allahu Akbar and what you are to expect in salah. And as I said to you last week, we don't want to see this as a lecture series. We want to see this as a holistic training program, a salah rehabilitating program. So what is the third layer? The third type of thinking, mindset, frame of mind that is required from you and I the moment we say Allahu Akbar. This is just before you begin your salah. We've spoken about keeping your mind focused on the salah. We've spoken about understanding the salah. We're going to do this all throughout our series, inshallah. Now, the third layer is a very special one. It's a particular mindset you need to load up before you begin your salah, and this will help enormously in bringing about khushu'a, focus, attentiveness, humility in salah. What is that third layer? 
It is a type of sentiment that you are all familiar with. And it's something you work with, perhaps on a daily basis. It's not something you're unfamiliar with, or something that is out of touch or out of hand. It's something you feel inside of you when you meet a friend whom you're attached to, the moment you are reunited with a beloved one. This is the feeling of raja, the feeling of hope. And this is, as Ibn al-Qayyim calls it, one of the three pillars of Iman. To have hope in Allah Jalla Jalalu. And it is so sad, I find it really a miserable reality that so many people have been missing out on this for so many years worth of salah. 10 years, 20 years, and he does not come into salah feeling a sense of raja, hope. You are expecting the best from Allah the moment you say Allahu Akbar and you begin your salah. Have you felt that before? <coughs> now that you have begun your prayer, you've realized that you've come into a place of security. Raja says to you, I am confident that security will be given to me. To enter your salah means you've come into a space of forgiveness of sins. Raja means you're confident that Allah will give you that forgiveness by the time you finish your salah. To say Allahu Akbar and begin your salah, it means you've come to a space of rahmah, mercy of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. To have raja, it means you're confident Allah is going to give you his rahmah. You begin your salah and your mind says to you, Allah will give me. Allah will endow me. Allah will forgive me. Allah will repair me. Allah will fix my problems. He'll heal my pains. He'll answer my dua. He's going to draw me near to him. You come into your, ha your salah and your heart is open. And your hands are spread forth. And you believe that he's not going to allow you to finish your salah till he fills your hands with his ni'mah, his bounty. And he will not allow you to walk away with a branch without leaves. Have you felt this? This one mindset really is enough to transform the salah, to come in with excitement, hope. You're going to be given. You're not going to be let down. How do we go about fostering this? How do we develop it? If you feel it's lacking, what can you do to bring it about? Such that you come into salah, with a huge level of anticipation, excitement, hope. A man who's poor, who's walking to wealth. A man who's ill, who's walking to health. A person who's unmarried, Allah will give them the answer dua. A person who is weak, Allah will give them strength. Deplorable iman, Allah will replace them with stronger iman. If you don't feel that type of raja, anticipation from Allah, and hope, good expectations, how do you bring it about? One of the quickest and easiest and most efficient ways of developing it, if it is lacking in your life, it is simply to know Allah Jalla Jalla. The more you know of Him, the more hope you will have in Him. The more you realize who He is through His words and through the descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and through the universal signs He's put around you, the more you will come into salah with hope, desire, a yearning, an expectation, excitement, things will go my way and I will be fixed and I will be forgiven. Knowing Allah. So take a tour of some of the texts that speaks to you of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and why He is deserving of raja, hope. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said speaking about Himself, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah wants to turn to you in forgiveness. وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا But those who've deviated, they want you to deviate with them a great deviation. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah wants to lighten your burden. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِفًا And man by his nature was created weak. SubhanAllah. Have you thought about coming into salah with this mentality? I'm about to stand before a Lord who wants to forgive me. He told me that. He wants to lighten my burden and he wants to make things easy for me. So remove.
from your mind that image that some people have of their Lord, a monster who's out to get them, a monster who's setting up traps to harm them. That is not the Lord we worship. Our Lord we worship is He who said about Himself, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِن شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ Why would Allah want to punish you if you are grateful and you are believers? Why would I, why would I want to punish you? What is in it for me, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to punish you? My kingdom doesn't grow. And your sins don't harm me. Why would I want to punish you? So come into salah with this hope. You're meeting a Lord who has every good you aspire for. And he will give you every good you aspire for. Look at the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. Which Bukhari and Muslim narrate on the authority of Abu Hurairah. He said, When Allah completed creation, كتب في كتاب He wrote in a book. Allah جل جلاله wrote in a book. Where is the book? فهو عنده فوق العرش And that book is placed on top of the throne. Subhanallah. On top of the throne, meaning above all of creation, at the very top, there is a book. And in that book there is a sentence. What does it say? إِنَّ رَحْمَتِي غَلَبَتْ غَضَبِي إِنَّ رَحْمَتِي غَلَبَتْ غَضَبِي My mercy has prevailed over my anger. لا إله إلا الله This is hope. My mercy has prevailed over my anger. Allah said وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses all things. Coming into salah therefore with that type of anticipation is huge. It's exciting. It's no longer a chore. It's something you need. And you stand before a caring Lord whom you now know not only has everything you need, but wants to give you everything you want and everything you need. And then you read that the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ana inda ghanni abdi bi falyadunna bi ma'sha. I, Allah, will be just as my servant expects me to be. So let him expect of me whatever he wishes. Allah says, I will be everything you expect me to be. So why not come into salah with that high expectation of Allah? Jalla Jalla. You come into salah and your expectation is that all of the sins you've committed, minor and major, public and private, Allah will erase them. He will erase them. Why not come into salah with the anticipation that I will be given Jannah through this salah? That my heart will finally rest in this salah. Why not come into salah with the expectation that, Ya Rabb, you will place me in Al-Firdaus Al-A'la, the highest gardens of paradise. And you will make me the neighbor of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah. Allah said, I will be just as you expect of me to be. So expect wherever you want. When you read these narrations, what happens? You know Allah. And when you know Allah Almighty, what happens? You begin to think highly of Him and you begin to expect the best. Salah now is an excitement. It's something you need. And then you read. The hadith which Bukhari and Muslim narrate on the authority of Abu Hurairah that the Prophet wasallam said, Inna lillahi tis'atan wa tis'ina, inna lillahi mi'ata rahmah. Allah's mercy is divided into 100 parts. Anzala minha rahmatan wahida. And he's only brought down to earth one of those 100 parts of mercy. Bain al jinni wal insi wal baha'imi wal dawab. And this one part of mercy is shared between mankind and jinn kind and the animals and the creatures. Through that one bit of mercy, they show affection to one another. And through it, they show mercy to one another. Till you see an animal raising its hoof from the ground so that it doesn't trample upon its young one. To that level. In other words, every dimension of mercy you may see in this world and what you don't see in this world is 
a part of one part of 100 parts of Allah's Rahmah. Isn't that amazing? Every dimension of mercy that you may see or you do not see. Because Allah said, وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ He creates what you don't even know. The rahmah that is shared between doctor and patient when he shows mercy towards him or her. That's from that one part. The mercy that is shown from a surgeon to the person he's about to operate on. It's from that one part. Subhanallah, the mercy of your mother towards you and all mothers of all creatures. The mercy of children towards their parents. The mercy of neighbors towards one another. The, the mercy of righteous governments towards their people. The mercy of animals towards one another. The mercy of the dinosaurs all those millions of years ago. The, the mercy in the oceans. The mercy in the heavens. The mercy of the prophets and messengers towards their communities. The mercy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine, subhanallah, the mercy of the jinn between them. All of this and more. All of it is part from one part of 100 parts of mercy belonging to Allah Jalla Jalalu. So the question now is where are the other 99 parts? And the hadith continues and it says, وَأَخَّرَ اللَّهُ تِسْعًا وَتِسْعِينَ رَحْمَةً يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ بِهَا عِبَادَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةً Allah has reserved the other 99 parts of mercy to express His mercy to the believers on the Day of Judgment. Okay. And that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he would say, لَا يَغْفِرَنَّ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مَغْفِرَةً لَمْ تَخْتُرْ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِ بَشَرْ Allah will forgive people on the day of judgment in a way that no human mind could ever imagine. So when you read a narration like that, what happens? It causes your ma'rifah, your knowledge of Allah to grow. When your knowledge of Allah grows, what happens? Your hope in Him mushrooms, it compounds. Hope, come into salah with this expectation. He will forgive. He will have rahmah. He will change my ways. He will repair my broken heart. He will repair my relationships. He will help me. He will. And Allah will be above my aspirations as well. And that is why, subhanallah and azim, in one of the most breathtaking hadith, which at Tirmidhi narrates on the authority of Anas, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Allah jalla jalaluhu said, and really open up your heart for this type of hadith as Allah speaks to you and he speaks to me. He said, Ya ibn Adam, O oh, son of Adam, إِنَّكَ مَا دَعَوْتَنِي وَرَجَوْتَنِي غَفَرْتُ لَكَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي O oh, son of Adam, so long as you call upon me and you have hopes in me, I will continue to forgive your sins and I will not mind. يَا ابْنَ آدَمْ لَوْ بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُكَ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءِ ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرْتَنِي غَفَرْتُ لَكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي O son of Adam, if your sins were to reach as high as the heavens, and then you apologize to me and you repent, I will forgive you and I will not mind. يَا ابْنَ آدَمْ لَوْ أَتَيْتَنِي بِقُرَابِ الْأَرْضِ خَطَايَا ثُمَّ لَقِيتَنِي لَا تُشْرِكُ بِي شَيْئًا لَأَتَيْتُكَ بِقُرَابِهَا مَغْفِرًا O son of Adam, if you come to me on the day of judgment with sins as much as the planet Earth, but you come to me having not associated partners with me, I will bring for you the same amount of forgiveness. La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. You read this hadith, what happens? Your heart is filled with excitement. Now you're looking forward to Salatul Fajr, your next salah. You're excited or maybe your qiyam, your night prayer, because you're going to stand in a space before a Lord who wants to give you. He has what you need. And he's saying to you from narration to narration, I want to give you, just ask of it. And I will be up to your aspirations and, and I will give you more than your aspirations. See, remove therefore that image that a lot of us have of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, of a monster, astaghfirullah, God forbid. A ruthless being who is looking to harm you, to torture you, who is searching for your faults to disgrace you and embarrass you. This is not a God that whom we recognize that alone submit to or worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no vendetta against people. 
Those were not my words. Those were the words of Imam ibn al-Qayyim, correcting the aqidah, the belief of a lot of people towards their Lord. He says, وَالرَّبُّ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى لَيْسَ لَهُ ثَأْرٌ عِنْدَ عَبْدِهِ فَيُدْرِكَهُ بِعُقُوبَتِهِ He said, Allah Almighty does not have a vendetta against people. Therefore, feeling compelled to punish them. وَلَا يَتَشَفَّى بِعِقَابِهِمْ Nor does Allah experience any pleasure in punishing people. وَلَا يَزِيدُ ذَلِكَ فِي مُلْكِهِ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ Nor does punishing people add to the kingdom of Allah in any way. And then Ibn Qayyim, he says, subhanAllah, heart-melting words. He said, وَلَوْلَا أَنَّ الْعَبْدَ هُوَ الَّذِي أَغْلَقَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَابَ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَأَغْلَقَ دُونَهَا بَابَ الرَّحْمَةِ بِسُوءِ اِخْتِيَارِهِ لَكَانَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فَوْقَ أَمَلِهِ وَفَوْقَ رَجَائِهِ He said, but if it wasn't for man, if it wasn't for man himself, who closes the doors of mercy and goodness on himself, by his bad decisions in life, he will find that his Lord is greater for him than his aspirations and greater than all of his hopes. He's saying there is no fault in our Lord, Jalla Jalaluh. He's saying it's the ill decisions that we make that therefore close these doors of mercy and goodness in our face. As for Allah, if you have hope in him and you give him the worship he deserves, he will be above your aspirations and he will be above what you hope for. So tell me of the salah of a person who comes into it with this type of mindset. Hope, hope, open heart, open mind, expectation, excitement. He will give me, he will grant me, he will endow me, he will shower me with khair and goodness. He will give me from his bounty, my life will change. Raja, one of the three pillars of iman. Uh, iman. And that is why Sahal al qatai one of our predecessors, he said that I saw Malik ibn Dinar in my dream. Malik ibn Dinar, one of our righteous predecessors, had just passed away. And he was known for his worship and his righteousness and knowledge. So Sahal, he says to Malik, Layta shi'ri madha qadimta bihi ala Allah. Brother, Malik, what happened when you met Allah Almighty? How did it go? And in the dream, Malik ibn Dinar said to him, قَدِمْتُ عَلَىٰ رَبِّي بِذُنُوبٍ عِظَامٍ I came to my Lord carrying huge amounts of sin. فَمَحَاهَا عَنِّي حُسْنُ ظَنِّ بِاللَّهِ But they were erased through my good expectations of Allah Jalla Jalla. SubhanAllah. Think well of him. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا يَمُوتَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُحْسِنُ ظَنَّ بِاللَّهِ Prophet said, none of you should die except in a state when you're thinking the best about Allah Jalla Jalla. Think well of him and come into salah with this mindset. Now, naturally, there is a, uh, there is a line, although blurry in the eyes of a lot of people, between having raja, hopes in Allah Almighty, and the other side of it, which is being delusional. And what is the line which shaitan is invested in blurring so that you cross from the former into the latter? What is the criteria? Ah, Ibn al-Qayyim, he says that if your so-called raja, hope in Allah, ends up pushing you to do more good deeds, it makes you a better Muslim, then this is a raja, this is hope that is praiseworthy. You can expect goodness from Allah. If, however, your so-called raja, hope in Allah, is actually pushing you to become lazy, complacent, you found now justifications for sin because apparently Allah is mercy, he will for merciful, he will forgive. And it's causing you now to uh, cut corners, to find shortcuts. Then this is not hope in Allah, this is ghurur, this is delusional thinking. This person is deceiving himself. So a person who thinks good of Allah, he does good in his life. So this is layer number what? Layer number three.